Hi, everybody. Welcome to Least Cake Live. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Michelle Benjamin. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Least Cake, and we're so happy you could take time out of your busy day to join us. Before we jump into the presentation, while everyone's joining, I'll just give you a little introduction. Um, who is Least Cake? In case you're not familiar, if you're not a customer of ours, we're a lease and location management platform built for multi-unit operators, including franchisees and franchisors. But we're not here to tell you about Lease Cake necessarily. This is not a sales pitch. That's not the kind of webinar we're going for. This is Lease Cake Live. It's supposed to be educational and helpful. And we uh, bring our customers and industry experts together. We have two of these experts in the house today. They're going to be talking about franchise lifecycle management. Um, we're going to explore strategies to grow and improve efficiency and complete seamless M&A transactions, if that's part of your plan. So before I pass it over to Taj to introduce our speakers, just two housekeeping items that I always get asked. Yes, we are recording this and we will be sharing it with you afterwards, just in case you want to listen again or if you're listening in the future. Um, and we definitely want to keep this interactive and encourage your questions throughout. So feel free to send those over. Just use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll keep an eye on them and answer them as we go. So. With that, I will introduce our moderator, who if you've joined a Least Cake Live session previously, you are probably very familiar with him. He is Least Cake's founder, Taj Adav. Taj, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Michelle. Welcome, everybody, for Least Cake Live. Welcome to the kitchen. As we like to say, some of the best conversations happen in the kitchen. And so we're really excited to have you here for today's webinar on franchise lifecycle management. I think People have talked about real estate lifecycle management, but franchise lifecycle management is a little bit of a different animal, and we're really looking forward to exploring that with our expert speakers today. Uh, they're here to share their experience and guide you through best practices and strategies to help your franchise grow and thrive. And it's really whether you're just beginning, you're in the process of scaling up, or even if you're working on a transaction to sell or acquire more locations, we're here to help on the PE and M&A side. So we can definitely cover that as well. Uh, just to let you know, we're here in Central Florida. There is a hurricane passing on the west coast of Florida. Shouldn't impact us. <laughs> We've got some blustery winds outside, but hey, you know what? The show must go on and we're really excited. So cross fingers, internet power will stay on. Uh, let me introduce our speakers to you. First up, there's a strategic, passionate and growth minded business leader with 20 plus years of experience in the restaurant, retail and financial services industry. And currently today, he's the owner of TIG Corp, which it, which operates 45 locations of several concepts, Green Turtle Sports Bar, Qdoba, and Dave's Hot Chicken across five states. Please welcome Pranav Desai. Hey, thank you for the introduction, Taj. Uh, been a great pleasure to be in having working with you for over three years now. And thank you for this community and uh, looking forward to be part of it and uh, share with me my stories, my best practices, background about us and open for any questions, any comments, um, just anything that we can do to share with the wider audience here. Absolutely. No, thank you so much, Pranav. You guys have been fantastic to work with and there'll be a lot to unpack here in the in the coming hour. Up ahead. So next up, we've got a leasing and development leader with 15 years of experience across a lot of brands, including Buffalo Wild Wings, Noodles and Company. And he currently serves as a senior vice president of real estate for Dave's Hot Chicken, which we all know is experiencing incredible growth. Please welcome Dan and Schiff. Dan. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here. And, and thanks, Taj and Michelle, for, for putting this together and uh, looking forward to a good conversation today. That's cool. So, hey, Dan, and just to let you know, I was up in the Lake Mary location and I ate a Reaper. It took me an hour and a couple of milkshakes <laughs> to, to do it, but it was it was an incredible experience. So anyway, I had to like indulge and uh, <laughs> yeah, I had I had my butt kick for sure. <laughs> you you are a brave soul. It is uh, it is an experience that uh, not everybody can handle. So uh, glad you're you're here with us uh, to tell the tale. Absolutely, I'm still alive. Yes. <laughs> well, it's it's a great recipe, and and I'm sure you know. Let's let's turn it over to Pranav. You have bolted on many different brands when you started. Could you share with the audience how you began, which brand you started with? 
and and what were the essential ingredients for you to start to scale up your organization with things that you needed to collect and manage? Absolutely. Thank you. So realistically, this journey started. Um, so it's really my partner, Jigger, myself and Raj, the three of us uh, have partnered and formed TIG Corp in about 2015. But that was the origin foundation of this company. Even before that, we were into franchise space for uh, since 2000. Um, we had Dunkin' Donuts. We were into checkers. We were doing a little bit um, independent, small operations, um, doing kind of with the family and friends. We realized that that was not going to be a scalable model for us. That was in 2015. We said, we are going to build something with our um, infrastructure, have to uh, scale. If we were to scale, do it with the right team in place. And uh, as part of it, we uh, started with a concept called the Green Turtle uh, Sports Bar. Yeah, it, We're big fanatics into sports, got involved with that, uh, developed four units in uh, Pennsylvania, Delaware market. Um, as part of that, it was one of the most complex and uh, large scale uh, enterprise that we took over. But before that, or in parallel to that, we built our um, back office accounting system, we build our HR, we build the sales marketing team, uh, development team. Uh, this was all done with the idea that we will um, have 40 to 50 units in about five to seven years we gave ourselves at that point. That was our first milestone. Um, we were well on way to hit that with some acquisitions in line till COVID hit in 2020 and as everyone are familiar being in a full service uh, concept was not very kind to us so we took we took some beating um, but we emerged stronger and that's where a little bit of that uh, the name I want to highlight so we called it the integrity group right and with a double t a lot of it was um, that yes we do it with honor with respect with uh, those core values that we had but big part of it was that there's two T's in our name. And that was the grit, the part. We never imagined that within just four or five years of it will be tested to the full extent of what that grit on perseverance would look like. And that was in 2020, people really tested. So we, we lost two of our stores, but in process, um, we learned a lot about this industry and the people and the resilience that it takes and uh, you know the teamwork. So we had an opportunity at that time to acquire some uh, assets on uh, Kidoba World. We acquired about in all within 18 months, 26 underperforming uh, assets from corporate. Um, with that, we were able to develop or open 10 more stores in three years. And then we um, came across with Davis. As everyone knows, Davis is the hottest, one of the most um, sexiest cool brand. Uh, we were lucky to be selected, um, work very closely with the executive team, and sign up for the development agreement for greater Philadelphia region. So with that, now we have majority of our growth coming in from uh, Dave's. Um, we are on track to open about seven to eight units in pipeline in the next, next 18 months. Um, we have about the same number on the Kidova side, where we have a larger territory. So we are very on track by 2025 end of it to be a 50 unit that we reached, um, originally intended to open by 2020. So we eventually met our <laughs> um, milestone. It just took us a little bit longer than what we had. And now our next step will be to get to our, over 100 units in next four to five years. So wow. that, that's really the TIG core. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the success. So uh, ultimately, one location in 2015 to, to 50 plus, and you're tracking to be over 100. Is that, that did is, I get that right? That is correct, in essence. Wow. And and what, what was the ingredient that, that you possessed to even start on the franchising life cycle? So that's a very yeah. good question. <laughs> really, with, with my background and what I have done in uh, strategy and uh, management consulting, when I joined hand with Jagger and Raj, we said, look, there is, if we don't have the team and if we don't know what we are good at and focus on that, we would not be able to achieve that. So we divided up our 
responsibilities very carefully and say, I will be leading on the strategy and the development of the people and the back end part, where Jigger, my partner, was focused on the growth and uh, getting all the funding, handling all the operations. And then Raj was managing the finance and the back. So that was really the ingredient that we had a shared vision, shared goal, yet very different and uh, unique uh, expertise that we all say we're going to focus on what we are good at and we really excel in those areas and uh, trust our partner to do what they are really good at. So that was one of the reasons why we were successful. Making, yeah, that, that makes sense. And when when was your first Dave's? First Dave's we opened, it took us, <laughs> Dan knows about this, it was in Philadelphia. Should have been open last year, um, you know, maybe in June, July, did not open till uh, February of this year. So we are, you know, we were about eight to nine months delayed. And then we have two more in pipeline that were again delayed by six plus months. So the first one was in uh, early part of Q1 of this year. Yeah, I gotcha. Okay. Well, very good. So um, Dan, and then from your perspective, I mean, you've got such incredible history. You've seen all the all the big brands and and now you're part of Dave's. So tell us what are the what are the key components of of scaling up, uh, not only from a, a franchisor's perspective, but also from a franchisee's perspective? Um, just elaborate on that if you could. Yeah, I, I think it starts. You know, franchising is about the right partners and and to partner with a group like the uh, you know Pranav and and Tig Group. You know that that's. Uh, that's a lot of this, right? Is is finding the right people. There are a lot of people who want to be in restaurants, and restaurants are not easy. As as you know, whether it's development and, and construction to operating a restaurant, it sounds sexy, uh, but it is gritty. For now, it it is definitely uh, not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, but I think a lot of you know the scaling is is having um, the pieces in place, and I think it's having. Uh, the right partners. Not everybody knows how to build a restaurant. So having the right construction and architecture partners to get you going in the right direction. Um, the marketing, the operational, all of the, the, the financial background. It, it, it takes having the right personality and the right group of people uh, to scale up something, um, whether it's you know from one to two or two to five. Um, you know, going from one to two is always the hardest from you know from growth perspectives. You know, it, you can do one. That second one is is a whole lot tougher. But going from two to five seems to be a whole lot easier. Uh, you figured out the process. You figured out, you know, what mistakes you made the second time around. And you start to build on that. And I think that's, you know, a lot of what we're doing with Dave's is we all come, you know, our, our leadership team comes with a lot of restaurant background and a ton of franchising. And we've been in different places over the years and we've learned, okay, if I could do this over again, I would do it this way. Or, you know, you make those mistakes and you learn from it and you come away with better practices. They may not be the best, but they're better along the way. And I think that really um, is a, a lot of the sauce. We have great fr franchise partners, but it's a phenomenal team uh, on the franchisor side to put our franchisees in a, in a place of having the right support. Uh, where they need it, whether that's the, yeah. the marketing, whether that's the operational side, whether it's, you know, real estate and development. Um, you know, we're here to uh, support our great partners and bring our expertise and our learnings from our collective backgrounds uh, to be able to be the support focused uh, franchisor that we are. Wonderful. Well, we are just absolutely honored to serve you as a very important customer. You've, Dave's has an incredible reputation in the industry. Uh, to be the leader. And I think, you know, you've encapsulated that approach, Dannon, uh, being very supportive of not just those that are in your brand, but also, you know, recognizing that there are other brand choices that your franchisees have made and the importance of of having a system to allow them to scale. So kudos to you and your team and, and your philosophy. I think fundamentally that, that really shines. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the details of organizing and, and having information at your fingertips, Stanon. Um, what types of documents are essential as you, you know, when you joined and, and now you've got, you know, geez, how many locations do you have? We are 226 as of this morning in 33 states, the Middle East, 
and Canada. Uh, coming in December or January will be our first location in the UK. Uh, in London, we started construction this week. So we are uh, on our way to our sixth country. Um, but uh, I mean, I met I met the Dave's team at Restaurant 2. Um, I, I was with a different company at the time, fell in love with the brand mm -hmm. and joined at Restaurant 9. And I think a lot of, you know, what I found about this team is, you know, we, we come from these backgrounds of growing brands and that idea of if I could do it again differently, what would I do? And it starts with, you know, the, you know, selecting the right franchise partners. Um, you talk to our uh, finance team, it's having the, the uh, systems in place to help the franchisees understand the data. And we are kind of in a position, you know, from maybe restaurant 50, uh, we were more in a place of a restaurant, you know, a brand of a thousand restaurants where we had some of those systems in place and we had some of those partners in place because we knew where we wanted to take this and we knew where we were going in terms of unit sales and, and franchise sales. Um, but it was a, it was a matter of if we don't do it early, we're playing from behind the eight ball when we wanted at restaurant 200 or restaurant 500. So it really was a, a thoughtful approach to, we know these are the systems we want. We know these are the the background pieces, uh, whether it's technology or it's uh, you know, the the design of the restaurant and, and and elements that we knew we wanted long term. But bringing them in early allows us to find the mistakes or or fix the processes that are there, and not have to ingest data for two hundred or five hundred restaurants backwards. It's a whole lot easier to build into it going forward. So we've really taken that approach from a systems perspective. Um, that includes Lease Cake. So shameless plug here for you, Taj and, and team. But you know that that was getting our documents in place, getting our finances in place, um, our franchisees P and Ls and sales information in place, so that we have the information at our fingertips um, as we grow, so that we can share information with our franchisees and we can be. Um, you know, that kind of open partner about the data and, and you know, kind of just in time information uh, to help them run their restaurants better and, and grow their systems better. I like that. So it reminds me of that adage, you know, don't don't build the plane as it's heading down the runway. Sounds like you have taken a very forward thinking approach to say, let's get the systems in place. Um, and, and I don't know if, if that encapsulates it the, the correct way, but um Let's turn this over to Pranav. So I think, you know, from our call a couple of weeks ago, we talked about beginning with the end in mind. I think you certainly had that goal, right? Back in 2015, one location, hey, we want to be X, right? You set these really lofty goals and you wanted to be big. And and now look at you, you know, you've got you got 50 locations, you're continuing to expand. So so what does that mean beginning with the end in mind? I mean, obviously you've got a, you know, very uh, project management disciplined background that you lean on but how do you how do you think about why you started what you're collecting and and making certain that you're planning for the future so and, and you know someone asked this question and this goes for us what we learned and this might that was for Danon, but what we had it, it was not just that it came to us automatically right with the end in uh, mind uh, from the yeah. get-go it was something that we were not able to, as Denon mentioned earlier, going from one to two, we know that it's harder and it yeah. becomes simpler, right? But then you get stuck at a number like eight or 10 by just doing everything by yourself, right? We got into that rut. We were able to get our concept, whether it's the Duncans or Checkers, mm -hmm. eight to nine to 10, but we did not have, it was uh, taking a toll on us to find some basic information when you're asked for, when we were exiting, when we sold Duncan's, right? Um, or when we were in checkers. It takes a time to, just to have like a data or a, um, a disciplined approach to how to get our information, not even data, just the information, right? Whether it's financial, whether it's from your HR or people side uh, and payroll side, whether it is from the lease side, right? So we already had experienced that and we knew that if we were going to start the TIG and if we had this lofty aspirations of where we want to be, we will not be able to develop those once we have reached there, right? 
we knew that from our um, prior experiences that we have to put these things in place early. Now, obviously, anything that we do comes with a cost, and there's a trade-off. The trade-off was that we had a lot of overhead, and uh, you know there were uh, teams and uh, systems in place which were an overkill for a small operations of at that time four units, right? But we were okay with that because that was done strategically. That if we did not have it, we would not be able to, um, you know, go ten x. And that was the decision we made. And uh, really, that was the um, only way I can say that we were able to um, properly scale. Now, could we have done it by keeping our overheads uh, slim and uh, small? Yes, I think we would have, but we would have come to a point where we just can't develop anymore. And we would have mm -hmm. been like, okay, that's it. Right now, we are able to take a few other acquisitions, few other new concepts, all these other things we are able to free up ourselves up to be able to do because we have right partners like yourself and Lease Cake and some of our uh, other technology slash systems that we have implemented and uh, partnered with. Yeah, yeah. It, it reminds me very much like you're a startup company, right? And there's this point of crossing the chasm. You you hit, you know, like you said, five locations, eight locations or 10, and then you kind of get stuck. So when you look at that and you step back, trying to figure out it and unpack the, the keys to success, it sounds like it's about getting faster access to information, being able to make strategic decisions, and having the the processes in place to trust the data behind it, so uh, I think that's 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 phenomenal. There's there's that analogy between kind of what we started at Lease Cake and what you're starting. I, mean, I think I think ultimately franchise lifecycle management is it's the story of a entrepreneur's journey to become, you know, the 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 chicken restaurant empire, right? Not necessarily building your real estate empire. Hundred percent agree with that. Touch couldn't have said it better. And yep. it's absolutely that journey, no matter what industry you put it or apply, it's the same value proposition that we have to run. Yep. Are we spending too much amount of time and money into this rather than focusing on our core business, working in the restaurant? But at the same time, you have to develop those sitting from outside and develop yep. those and trust the people who are running the restaurants and being those operations guy to give them mm -hmm support that they need ultimately as dan mentioned earlier like like their franchise system is great working with us we have to do the same for our operations team who's running the front line to give them the best available um, tools and systems and uh, ability to measure their success and find their opportunities so that they can run the restaurant to the maximum capacity yeah Makes makes sense. So love the questions coming in on the Q&A, by the way. We're planning to answer these all live and in true fashion. Here we go. So Dannon, what's the what's the mistake that you made or you recognized, whether it's at Dave's or even prior, that uh, you needed to identify and that you managed to kind of correct to scale up? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of them, and I've been fortunate enough to be with some growth brands uh, in my career. Um, you know, some of it was earning the right to grow. Um, you know, in 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 some instances, you know, the the development goals. I, I think back to an early brand that I was a part of. Uh, the goal was to grow really quickly, and this was 2005, 2006, 2007, where development was on fire, opportunities were left and right, uh, but we weren't ready to grow at that pace. Uh, we had we had developed one market. We did 15 stores in 18 months in you know the Midwest, but we didn't have the people, the systems. Development was pulling everybody along, and we suffered for it. And I think we've taken a little bit of that approach um, and, and some of that learnings now. Um, we thought you know this is Dave is a brand that grew through COVID. Uh, our founder started in 2017. Our franchising started in 2019, 2020. Um, so we, we grew a lot through COVID through both franchise sales and development. Um, we didn't have all the information about what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we brought on mobile data partners, uh, our third party partners have provided us with some information, uh, but we were growing kind of with that, that old school, fast, casual mindset of every couple miles, you could put a store 
And we weren't really understanding the effects of third party and the, the draw that the Dave's brand is where our customers come from a bit further away than they do for other brands. Um, and we learned, we, we built two restaurants that were too close and we watched the impact and we recognized it quickly. And we said, if we're going to get to the, the big, you know, 500,000 restaurant, you know, goal of, of this brand, we've got to do this smartly. And so we, we quickly pivoted and we went back to our, our franchise partners and we shared the data, um, you know, openly and said, hey, here's what we thought. Here's the decision we made. It turned out to be uh, more impactful than we expected. So our, our direction is to you know, space things out more and strategically grow within each individual market. Um, because, I, you know, with franchise brands and with any brand, if, if things aren't going well and your stores aren't performing, you're not going to invest in new development. You're not going to you're not going to continue to grow. Uh, so we really kind of took a step back and said, okay, let's look at every market. Let's let's think more strategically now that we have this new information, and we got out of Southern California and into Texas and into uh, Colorado and into Michigan and Chicago. The the That's markets cool. are all different, and and so we really had to uh, be honest and candid about you know the decisions we made were not for you know uh, malicious reasons or or negative reasons. Um, but it was, it, you know, we, we want right by our franchisees. So it, it caused us just to kind of rethink um, our development strategy as it relates to building out a market uh, so that we have our franchisees wanting to do eight stores in, you know, 15, 18 months. And they understand and, and they recognize, and I think, you know, hopefully Pranav, uh, we've had a couple of those conversations about, we like it, but is it the right thing to do at this moment in time? And it's a tough conversation, but it's all with, you know, franchisee success in mind. Uh, and, and that's how we as a franchise are going to continue to grow is with, you know, uh, successful and profitable franchisees. Yeah. How do you keep track of with this growth and with, with obviously young franchisees, new franchisees, experienced ones, but new right. to the system? Uh, how do you manage closure mitigation and and staying one step ahead of key deadlines? Like, yeah, I mean, I, you know, for us, it, it starts about, you know, kind of big picture from 30,000 feet the day the franchisee signs. And yeah. it, it is a life cycle thought. That, and, and that's why we, at a certain point in time, realized that we needed a, a, a partner and a, a system in place that replaced the old Excel spreadsheet and Microsoft Outlook reminders uh, to, to manage some of this and to get ahead of it so that um, we understand what we're doing, um, whether it's uh, multiple restaurants, multiple deals with one landlord partner and making sure that we've got consistent language across those leases, um, not only from a franchise or perspective, but to help our franchisees move quicker. If we can be a, a partner in that to say, hey, a lease in, in this other state with this franchisee with the same landlord has language here. We, we, we can be helpful to getting these deals done. They've agreed to it there. They didn't, you know, that we didn't see this in this other, it, it's helped move our process along. So our franchisees aren't spending as much time negotiating leases or negotiating, you know, letters of intent on the upfront side of the deal. Um, but it's also there to help us understand you know, what are the rent structures? How can we understand without having to call our franchisees and ask them for, you know, what, what did you pay in rent last month? Just having a basic rent schedule and, a, and a, a term schedule for these leases helps us understand, you know, kind of how does occupancy play into the profitability of the restaurants. But as we get towards some of the end of life uh, conversations about some leases, um, you know, we're, we're able to manage not missing a date. Your, you know, uh, your renewal option notice period starts in 30 days, that type of thing. So we're, we're, we're not behind the schedule and we're not, you know, calling a landlord saying, oh, shoot, I missed my, my deadline to renew. Will you be gracious enough to give me my time back uh, right now? And, you know, the, the low vacancy rates that we're seeing nationally, the answer is no, you miss a date, you're done. Um, cause somebody else will come in behind you. So, you know, we want to be a partner for our franchisees. We want to be, you know, there to support them, but also, you know, be a backstop. 
and, and we put some of those development processes in place, whether it's on the front end or the back end, to help our franchisees long term and be that, you know, kind of support minded function. Got it. it. You used a few phrases that I want to come back to. You, you, you said old school. Uh, you were talking about either archaic systems or, or systems that don't give you the visibility to act quickly and and have speed of decision making based on sound data. Might be putting a you know a few words in your mouth, but I think that's what you're talking about. It's like how do you provide tools on both sides, not just for you to succeed, but also your franchisees. Um, and I think that's a big testament because I would say that we're starting to see that that kind of movement. If you can't stay ahead of this hyper competitive environment in uh, not just in real estate, like you said, the lowest vacancy rates that we've ever seen. Uh, new developments are almost at a standstill with inflation. So it's retail spaces at a premium. Right. Um, being able to empower your franchisees and being that backstop, I think you you hit the nail on the head. Um, keep keep your questions coming. So Pranav, you want to expand on visibility of data and, and speed of decision making. Obviously, you've got you know, two really great partners and you've divvied up responsibilities. But how important is it to get this information surfaced so you can make these strategic decisions much more quickly based on sound information? Absolutely critical, Saj. Um, you know, I don't know how we survived or we lived pre this tools and systems in place. You know, so think of it as this way. Now we use Google Map, right? And or any map system, right? Apple, whatever is your preference. You take it for granted because you don't have to think. You know exactly when you're going to be there, what route you're going to take, what toll you're going to pay, and just make decisions. I think of it as the systems of our new Google Maps, right? And back in the days, were we able to reach? Yes, we used you know printouts of MapQuest or whatever it was, right? Or even before that, before me, it was maybe the <clears throat> the, the 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 book, right? And you open it up, the MacBook, and uh, find directions and go there. We, yes, we survived. We were able to do it. But now that you live through the Google Map days, would you want to go back to that? I feel the same way using systems like Leasecape, like, you know, I'll name some of our partners, like, you know, our HR system, which has uh, AI built to it, or our review systems with, uh, you know, bird eye view and some of this analytics and uh, data that is provided to us we can make a decision. And now if I have to go back to the old ways of doing it, and we have done it by the way, so I've lived both systems, right? We were on, as Dan had mentioned, had our Excels and have some notifications come out on uh, email and then have a dedicated person looking at, in this case, example lease, right? So we have a paralegal looking at this um, periodically and say, you know, are we, is always in your back of your mind, are we gonna miss out? Are we going to, miss any renewal terms, right? Now we don't have to worry because we know we have done the legwork when we implement it. We set it up properly. We have the right notification, right team that is responsible for looking at this thing. And then once the notification comes in, we have ability to act on it quickly with the right intelligence and then feedback mechanism to be able to go and address them. So very critical. Um, we cannot see a world without it now. Um, and uh, I think, yes, it is a little bit of that, you know, process upfront that you have to go through to go put my 35 leases into the system and structure it properly and, um, you know, uh, format it the right way, set up the right notifications. Yes, we have to go through and do all that, uh, but that is one time, right? So 80% of the let work that we did now, remaining just 20% um, of managing and overseeing, you know, the systems that we have implemented. Yeah. So yeah. absolutely critical. Well, you, so it's it's almost like you, you now have more time to make strategic decisions and not spend 80% of your time in the minutia. Uh, I, I, I just love your map analogy. I, I, the first time I've, I've really heard it, but I think it, it uh, deserves spending some time on it. It's kind of like it was good enough. You have paper maps, you're driving around, or maybe you had a GPS device. Do you remember the worlds of, of you know the TomTom, oh, the that. GPS I, I, devices? Yeah. 
I skip one piece. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's all, it's it's all good, and it, and then it becomes you know it's like oh man you know, it's good enough. It's good enough. Well, you know what? Good enough's not good enough anymore. And I would say that the smart modern franchisees and the franchisors are are really looking at potentially even like leveling the playing field. Uh, Cause I think Dan and you touched on the importance of seeing consistency across your landlords and language that you can push on because you might have a division of, you know, Smithfield or, or bricks or, you know, a large, national tenant, uh, sorry, national landlord, and and recognize that, geez, the left hand's not talking to the right hand, and you need to now force that issue and say, I demand these terms because you gave them to me on this location. Is that what you're talking about, Dannon? Yeah, you know, it, it obviously is franchising. You know, we've got franchisor language that, that helps, uh, especially, you know, through transactions in the future and, and franchise relations and things like that. But there's there's just consistency, you know, why would we agree to a use of a Dave's Hot Chicken that was one set of language and, and one paragraph? And then another one, you've got an attorney from another region who wants to word things differently within the same company. And you can say, look, we've got three leases with you over here that all read the same way. Why are we recreating the wheel over in a different region on uh, the, the same terms? And, and and it's not you know English to another language. It's it's we're we're, we're saying the same thing here, um, and and that's been helpful to you know the landlords because they get their rent faster in theory because the deal gets done and everybody starts moving quicker. But it also gets our franchisees moving, and it also it, it takes a piece of the process out of there that they don't have to worry about because we've got the tools to show them, hey, here's a recent deal that we did with that same landlord here are some of the, the the pain points just to get through that first one to the second one. And let, let's help you move along because we can be that, that support. We can be that, uh, that guide or, or, or backstop, I guess is, is the word I like to use just to, to help the franchisees move that piece along. Um, especially in this era, the faster we can move on a real estate and development side, the more attractive we are, to a lot of uh, landlords who are, you know, they've got space, it's going to come back, it's going to move quickly, the quicker we can move. Um, it, it's been helpful to get us to the top of the pile. I love it. it. Because with every day that you can advance your opening, it equates to, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, right? On, on all ends, hopefully. Well, right, exactly. It's like, it's a win, win, win. It's like, why wouldn't a landlord want their tenant to move in faster pay rents? Why wouldn't you want to move into that location and delight your guests and your restaurant customers with an amazing, amazing product and ultimately kind of change the fabric of that neighborhood uh, right. you know, with your brand? Uh, I exactly. love that. I love that. Um, so this might be, Dan, a question that is more on the franchise development side, but um, this this came in and keep your questions coming. I, I, I love the interactive nature of this. We don't we don't wait till the end to, to deal with questions. So, um, flat base franchise fees versus percentage base franchisees is is that in your purview to answer? You know which one's better to implement? It's a loaded, a bit of a loaded question because I think it depends on the life cycle of the franchise brand you're in. Yeah, um, I think it depends on. Uh, the, the success of the brand. Uh, I've seen both. I've seen, you know, flat based and I've seen percentage based. And I think when you're uh, maybe not in a advantageous position as a franchisor, a percentage based or, you know, a non flat based or, or even zero franchise fee, uh, you know, you, you might make a decision to bring a franchisee on uh, if you really want to grow a territory by offering incentives. And I look at percentage base as, as incentivizing somebody to take a territory that may be uh, underperforming or, uh, you know, had, had been a laggard for so long or a period of time. And you need to re-energize it with a franchisee and you you might have to give those financial inducements. Um, I, I think it, it really depends on the brand that you're at and, yeah. and what your goals are. Um, we are flat based uh, franchise fee. Yeah, uh, um, you can find that in all of our documentation. But you know that you, you know, then it, it just comes down to where you're at in your life cycle. I, I think is 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 a lot of why a franchisor might choose to go one direction or another. 
Good feedback. Wonderful. So on the on the percentage, let me just ask this question. Maybe front up. Do you have any percentage rent uh, deals from a lease perspective with landlords? We do, and uh, that's uh, we are seeing more and more in uh, AAA plus kind of uh, landlords and malls. Um, they, you know, especially with uh, brands like Dave, who you know they. To be fair, I mean, they are, they want to see the upside um, and I don't blame them. But at the same time, we negotiate a deal that it is both uh, fair, that yes, they, we understand why they want to do a percentage rent deal. But at the same time, we don't want to commit to something that, you know, they only benefit uh, when there is the upside, but then they have nothing um to offer us so we either have a good uh, ti package or we have good work letter so there there's always um negotiation to be had and we generally are very aggressive we don't mind them to be part of um you know if we are successful you be part of it we are okay with that logic um but where we are not okay is if it's one-sided and they just want to arm twist and say you know this is it take it or leave it we'll say okay we're willing to give you that but upfront, you have to help us be successful and build this beautiful restaurant for us and get us the prime visibility. And uh, yes, in what, because you are helping us get to that level of success with the right kind of brand and the partners we have, we are okay to share the pie because we are all successful together. Right. Well, that uh, it, that sounds like a much more collaborative, constructive environment if you have the right deal terms, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> And we have some, some, and to be fair, we do have a little bit uh, leverage as well because not all brands would want to do that, right? Here, they will give us some concession because they know that they really want to work with us and with the Daves um, in their shopping centers. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, good job, Dan, and, and <laughs> in the brand and then the rollout. I, I'm, I'm just here to help uh, the growth, but I think you know it's, it's an interesting question, just of, you know, it, it, it pushes the landlord to be more of a partner. If they can drive more traffic to the shopping center, that hopefully benefits Dave's and our franchisees uh, on the sales side, you know, but it's got to be to a point where it, it you know, as Pranav said, it, it's not one-sided, right? Everybody's got to make money before you can share any profits. <laughs> and so it's, it's, uh, it definitely, it, it it's a deal point we're seeing more of. It, it's it's tough. It's tough to say uh, you're willing to do something, but if you bet on yourself and you set your terms in the right way, where you can be successful, a franchisee might be willing to agree. We also, you know, it, it it's all part of the deal when you wrap all the terms together, um, and and so it, it's uh, it, it's a tricky moment right now, just with you know, like you said, vacancy is low. Everybody's, you know, there's still a lot of brands expanding. So there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, motivation to get deals done. Got it. Um, so we haven't even talked about Conyers. Did you guys have an opening <laughs> yesterday? Uh, we opened in Conyers two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Uh, in, in the east side of Atlanta, one of the suburbs. And uh one of our one of our uh, crazier openings, I think I would venture to to you know call it. Uh, yeah, we uh, our franchisee there um, actually has uh, financial investment by Usher, and uh, as part of the opening, uh, we did something we've never done before. We had eight hundred mini drones flying over the restaurant in what I think was a ten to twelve minute drone show uh incorporating uh you know dave the chicken and our brand and uh it was seen from miles away we're right off i-20 there uh coming out of atlanta so definitely backed up traffic to figure out what's going on in the uh the night sky uh but no we we actually you know that was that was a lot of fun and um kind of something special that we were able to do um to just kind of uh welcome the brand to Atlanta. Um, 100%. so that, that was exciting. We opened today in, uh, in Toledo and Chesapeake, mm -hmm. Virginia. So our first restaurant in Northwest Ohio, our first restaurant in the Tidewater market. 
Um, we opened in Vermont a few weeks back. Uh, so there's been a lot of, um, you know, really exciting uh, new stores, new markets for the brand. Uh, and the reception has been uh, phenomenal, to say the least. So we're, That's cool. we're really excited about what the rest of this year has to, to offer. And uh, we'll be over 250 restaurants before the end of the year. And, you know, looking into next year, we've got some exciting, exciting deals and exciting markets on docket. Wow. All right. So I'm going to go off script, Dan. And okay. You're going to hate me for this. Fine. So I was, I was on the phone probably about a couple months ago with the, the very first franchisee of Dave's and they're very well connected, obviously. So the, the partner, investor, and operator of the Conyers location is Usher. Yes. <laughs> And what was so cool about the conversation that I had with this uh, you know, this great founding team, uh, first franchisee of Dave's, on a Zoom call, much like this, his phone started to blow up. And I said, hey, you know, if you need to grab that phone call, take a look. And he said, you know, I'm happy to reschedule. And he said, he's like, no, no, no. Did you see the press release? Usher is now an investor and an operator of of multiple locations in the Atlanta area. And it's like, so... So I'm one degree of separation from Usher. Is that, is that what you're telling me? <laughs> so. I, you know, I, I have not had the the good fortune of meeting him yet, but yeah, he, yeah. he um, was challenged by his kids a couple of years ago uh, to do the Reaper challenge. He had something had gone wrong or he had done something and his kids challenged him to try the Reaper and he posted to social media. Uh, he was dancing because of the heat and uh you know he's from atlanta from that part of the country and uh the opportunity came up he approached us about investing and uh invested in in that group's development in atlanta which is uh it, it's really cool it, it kind of speaks mm -hmm. to the power of the brand of yeah. uh, some of those partnerships that we're able to explore and uh to have him on board uh was definitely uh you know kind of a, a really cool announcement uh, to be uh, with this brand when it's happening. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I couldn't resist, but I think everything that you've been talking about, which is increasing transparency between your franchisees and at the franchisor level, supporting them with capable technology, allowing them to really be empowered to take a much stronger position potentially with their landlord as it relates to uh, lease terms and negotiation. Uh, uh, that's phenomenal. So um, kudos to you. I uh, appreciate Brian. that. No, it, it, it really, if we can give our franchisees the information to make smart, thoughtful, and logical decisions, then, you know, it, it's going to come back with, you know, franchisees extending terms and, and you know, sticking around and, and continuing to build. Um, if not, you know, if you're a franchisor that hoards the information, doesn't share um, you know, is more concerned about opening, 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 and not necessarily the success. I, I think that's really, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's it, in my personal opinion, it's not the right approach, right? It, it's, it's one sided, it's transactional. This is about growing and being with people and, and watching other people, you know, succeed. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of, you know, our team's perspective here is that our franchisee success is our success. And, you know, we, we will grow through franchising. We will grow through, you know, whether it's menu innovation or ideas and marketing and things like that, the franchisees are going to help along the way. And you've seen it with a lot of successful brands. Franchisees have created, you know, iconic products and they've, they've, created uh, marketing campaigns or brought marketing campaigns to the franchisor that have stood, you know, 20, 30 years over time. Yeah. And it, it's that partnership and that creativity um, that is, uh, you know, a lot of the, the earlier question about the mistakes. If it's one sided and you're pushing downhill and telling the franchisees what they should do, it, it changes things versus, yeah, we've tried it in our corporate restaurants here's the facts, here's the ROI, here's that data to, to back up why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, the buy-in is there, whether it's in real estate or it's operational or it's marketing or it, whatever it might be. Um, yeah. It really just comes down to that transparency and that openness to share information. Yeah. Uh, it, and I think that's why we're here to educate. I mean, simply when I founded the company almost seven years ago, it's almost like the market wasn't ready. 
And there was definitely this old school mentality, but today there's still that old school mentality, unfortunately, which is open, 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 hit your opening day, cut me your, you know, your royalty check and, you know, talk to you later. Uh, unfortunately, those kinds of operators are still in existence, but over time, this trend is now starting to take place where there's smart franchisors are saying there's got to be a different way. And you guys are definitely a model of that. Um, from an empowerment perspective, let me turn this over to Pranav. You you touched on um, you know, being able to negotiate stronger, better terms that are obviously fair and balanced. But how did you feel back when you began in 2015 as, as a brand new operator at Green Turtle? Did you feel like you were outgunned, out, outmanned, or did you feel like it was equitable? Like, What was the journey now comparing today versus way back then? It's a great question. And it reminds me of those days when, uh, no, it was not easy. It was not something that was fair. Uh, I remember there were times when we were first signing up uh, with new locations, with uh, Green Turtles, even with the days of Kidova. The landlord would make us come visit them and face to face, they would not trust, they would not know, A, the brand, B, who we are as operators, our operational capabilities. So it was really as if like, you know, okay, why should I do business with you? And why would I um, trust you and sign this 10 year lease where we are saying, okay, but we are taking all the risk. We're building this $2 million restaurants, right? And I'm, mm -hmm we're putting all this capital behind it. We have, and if anyone, it's just us who should be looking at how are you supporting us and why should we partner? But it was never about partnership. It was, why should I trust you? And I get it. I understand that there would be some hesitance, but it was not fair. Today, um, it's different. Now, it's just yesterday, we are doing portfolio reviews with some of the larger RITs, right? And uh, likes of uh, federal or... Uh, uh, Simon, and they are pitching, they're coming to our office, sh um, sharing with us what their development plans are, um, saying why we should consider now we have four or five different brands. We're like, okay, we, we carve out this area for you. Would you be able to take up this and uh, utilizing that as a means to attract more tenants to those shopping centers, right? So yeah, it's a completely opposite and different equation. Obviously, that doesn't mean they're going to agree to all of our terms. Because, you know, there's still um, prime locations and A plus sites, but at least now we have a equitable, fair, uh, respectable relationship where, you know, we can work on a deal as partners, as opposed to just them doing us a favor. So Makes sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a big change. Um, but I guess we all have to do our part. Can't expect to be uh, sit on the table day one. Uh, we just have to, you know, do the hard work through ourselves, uh, do the right, you know, things by the brand, by our people, and ultimately with our landlords and meet our obligation. And uh, we feel that uh, the momentum is behind us and we can uh, we can uh, be part partnering with this kind of uh, landlords. And yep. yep, it makes sense. It's the uh, this natural evolution and kind of a rebalancing of power, if you will, using using technology and and, and information to your best benefit, because if you're able to spend more of your time thinking about strategy than the minutia of document management and date controls, uh, there's this uh, kind of a, like this renaissance, <laughs> hopefully. And, and to be fair, you know, these tools help us be, you know, now they don't, before the power used to be with these big players, they already had these tools, right? Or they had the manpower, we did. We were at their mercy to say, within half an hour, blah, 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 you know, you have all these leases, you have all these things in our portfolio, this, this grid, this, this, this. We didn't have, it was not even uh, level, uh, equal level playing field, right? Now we have the same information, especially when you have partners like Dave's or Kidoba who are willing to help us that they will provide this information of, what is what kind of terms that uh, say Simon has across the country for any Dave's or any Kidova, right? Yeah. We have that information now at the fingertips. Going into this conversation, we are smart and we're educated about the conversations and how it's going to play out. So absolutely to your point, without the data and that information, 
and the analytics behind it and how quickly, more importantly, how quickly can we access that information? It's uh, incredible how we can negotiate and even work on the strategic, more longer term kind of um, you know, work that we do versus going through the spreadsheets and scanning and going through some PDFs to try to find out few information that might take three hours. Complete waste of our time. Yeah. Wow. So we've got um, a couple minutes. I want to touch on, you know, you know we're, we're kind of near the end of this life cycle, which is how do you bolt on more locations faster once you've got this engine and you've got the team and you've got all this, all the pistons firing. Um, so uh, maybe if you want to touch on an m a potential transactions, do you see that in your future, Pranav, um, from a due diligence perspective, looking at who you're acquiring, how clean that deal is? 100%. Um, not so much, unfortunately, in Dave's world because it's <laughs> there's not much available, right? <laughs> Otherwise, we will be all over it. But that's not the case. But that's a young brand, um, more so in other brands. So we definitely have like maybe three or four deals that we are reviewing at any given time. Um, but again, same thing with our due diligence. It is so much easier um, working with the similar type of franchisees. They would have you know some shape or form of this kind of systems. If not, even then it's fine. We can just ingest or put it into our uh, analytical systems and get the reports done within half a day versus what it used to take like a week of few analysts to go through that. So, it, you know, and, and as we prepare, as you say, for ourselves as well, tomorrow, uh, if we are on the selling side and if we want to uh, re-optimize our portfolio, we have all the information that is easily available if someone comes along I need to have my ducks in a row. What I expect from, you know, for, as a buyer, mm -hmm. I need to think from a seller perspective also down the road, are, do we have everything buttoned up? Do we have the right information that to share so that we can evaluate or someone can evaluate our business? And, uh, you know, we feel that we are in a very good spot right now, both in terms of ability to review new deals and when time comes, to have our uh, portfolio being analyzed. And uh, um, because look, sometimes the bank, not just even for m and uh, banks need some information, right? And with the lending and where things have been, you know, the better and more um, optimized information and data that we provide them, they're much better able to get us information sooner and underwrite so it saves them time to go through all that. We are just giving them ready-made uh, everything in that same format so that it just quickly go through their system and tell us, you know, how, or if we should review that package or not. Wonderful. So, so even better financial terms, right? Not only being able to underwrite, but I'm sure you've got some leverage uh, to get good terms. Yep. Well, good stuff. Um, all right. So we're going to, we're going to wrap up. We've got um, a couple of questions that kept come across. This is an odd one. So, so Dan, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, best For advice I've ever received. That's a, such a big question. Um, you know what? I, honestly, it, it's just stay humble. I, you know, and, and I've, I've, I've gotten it along the way of all of this is that, you, you know, you can be up, you can be down. Um, but, you know, just, just staying humble and just staying uh, in the moment is so much more towards building these relationships, you know, with, with franchisees, with landlord partners, with outside partners, you know, that, that humility and just being, uh, you know, kind of candid and honest uh, really goes a long way uh, to building the right relationships for the future. You never know when you're going to run into somebody down the road yeah. and, uh, you know, treating people the right way is, is really, um, you know, kind of that, that first rule. So as, as, Kind of ubiquitous as it seems, um, you know. I think that's still something that uh, you know I will pass down, but you know, yeah. keeps being reminded to me. Absolutely. All right, Pranav, we'll, we'll flip it around. So, the best advice you've ever given, and don't and don't say to, for Dan and to be humble. 
<laughs> <laughs> the best advice that I've given is, well, so I would say this along the same line as Damon. I say, if you want to be treated a certain way, you have to earn your right to be in that position. So it's really that old cliche that don't respect is earned, right? If you want to be respected, you have to learn to how to take care uh, of people. You're, you know, what, how you appear, how you take care of other people. It's not just about um, talking the good game. It's really living it and being the role model. So really the advice that I give is respect is earned. Nothing comes, you know, just given. No, there is no such thing as just you, you can take it for granted or you deserve it. You're going to. Love it. Well, we have enjoyed this time. I certainly have. And uh, I know we've got some good questions coming from the audience. We are going to be sending out this recording uh, on demand. So look for it in your emails coming up. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Dan, any parting comments? No, if, if we're, well, I guess the only one is if we're not in your neighborhood now, uh, you know, hopefully we will be soon, but, uh, you know, appreciate you putting this together, Taj and, and Pranav and Michelle, you know, it's been a lot of fun. Wonderful. Pranav, any, any other last comments? No, thank you for having me. I was glad to be able to share um, my experiences and uh, my advices. Anyone want to reach out, hit me up. Uh, I'm here. We are in this together and we only get stronger by helping each other out. So thank you, Taj and Michelle for Amen. having me. Dan, and as always, glad to be on this conversation together. Amen. All right. Thanks all. Have a great rest of the week. We survived the hurricane, looks like. So. There we go. <laughs> all right. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.